Presbyterian Universality Church, 505 East Charleston Street, Palo Alto, peace activist Barbara George, dead at the age of 52. Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area after some morning low clouds and fog along the coast. Highs in the lower 60s at the coast to the mid-70s inland in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Mostly sunny with highs from 77 to 87 degrees. That's it for the news tonight on this Thursday. March 18th. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Shoverick Henson, Rachel Herndon, and Bonnie Bone, who produced the recorded portions of this broadcast. Kelly Ormars is at the controls with Max Pringle. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. This week in the community calendar, AIDS Orphanage Benefit, Women's Foundation Gala, Grey Panthers presents a talk, Unlearning Sexism Workshop, This is a listing of upcoming events for the Bay Area. Please listen closely for contact numbers. Dine out for a rural Uganda AIDS orphanage at the Unicorn, a pan-Asian cuisine restaurant, on March 23rd. Lunch is from 11.30 to 3 p.m., and dinner is from 5 to 10 p.m. Sponsored by the Priority Africa Network and ACT UP East Bay. Call 510-841-4339 for reservations. On the evening of March 23rd, at the San Francisco Weston St. Francis Hotel, the Women's Foundation of California presents an anniversary gala to benefit community organizations serving women and girls. The gala will feature Dr. Bernice Reagan of Sweet Honey in the Rock and a tribute to Representative Barbara Lee. Call 415-837-1113, extension 303, for more information. The San Francisco Grey Panthers presents a talk with newly elected KPFA board member, Riva and Teen, who will report on the U.S. Department's attack on civil liberties on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. at the San Francisco Park Branch Public Library at 1833 Page Street. Call 415-552-8800 for more information. Stir Fry Seminar Consulting, the producers of the award-winning film The Color of Fear, will be presenting an unlearning sexism workshop on March 26th through March 28th at the Berkeley Training Center. For more information, call 510-204-8840, extension 101. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA apprenticeship program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510 510- 848-6767, extension 621. That's 510-848-6767, extension 621. The community calendar is also available online at www.kpfa.org. You're listening to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno. It's 703. Stay tuned for Apex Express. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. Tonight we hear poetry from Youth Speaks. We'll hear about a new report recently released about growing youth concerns in API communities in San Francisco, and we'll highlight the South Asian Film Festival, as well as we'll be giving away tickets for the Directions in Sound event happening in San Jose this weekend. I'm Ranjit Geisler. Stay tuned to Apex Express. But first, we honor Aung San Suu Kyi for International Women's Month. Today we salute Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi is the daughter of one of Burma's most cherished heroes, the martyred Aung San, 
commander of the Burma Independence Army, who led his country's fight for independence from Great Britain in the 1940s. Aung San Suu Kyi has equaled her father's heroics with her passionate fight for freedom and democracy in Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Aung San Suu Kyi spent her early years living and studying in India and the United Kingdom. In 1988, she returned to Burma to nurse her ailing mother, where she found herself caught in the middle of an unprecedented political struggle for democracy in her homeland. Millions of people had hit the streets to put an end to the Nguyen government's 26-year dictatorship, and thousands of pro-democracy protesters were massacred. This sparked Suu Kyi's work in the pro-democracy movement. She began to speak out against the Nguyen dictatorship and traveled extensively throughout the country, giving hundreds of speeches, often to crowds of thousands, in an attempt to unite the people and reinstill their courage in achieving their long-sought goal of freedom. In 1989, Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest for her political involvement with the National League for Democracy. The military offered to free her if she agreed to leave Myanmar, but she refused to do so until the country was returned to civilian government and all political prisoners were freed. In 1990, the people turned out in vast numbers to vote for Aung San Suu Kyi and her party to become the new government of Myanmar. Even though Suu Kyi was under house arrest, the National League for Democracy still won an 82% landslide, which took the country's military rulers by surprise. Refusing to acknowledge defeat, the military junta refused to give up power and held Aung San under house arrest until 1995. During that time, in 1991, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for what the Nobel Committee described as, quote, one of the most extraordinary examples of civil courage in Asia in recent decades. Nine years later, she was honored by then U.S. President Bill Clinton with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. Today, Aung San Suu Kyi remains under house arrest for the third time since 1988 after being detained in the wake of political unrest, which also triggered a sweeping crackdown on her party. As confrontations and negotiations continue between the NLD and the government, Aung San Suu Kyi continues in her struggle for democracy in Burma. We proudly honor her and her social and political works. For International Women's Month, I'm Ranjita Gieser. You always mother. Sometimes lover. You are listening to Apex Express on KPFA. I'm Ranjita. There was a report recently released called Moving Beyond Exclusion, focusing on the needs of Asian youth in San Francisco. This report provides information on juvenile justice, behavioral health, and youth views. There was recently a press conference on March 10th reporting on the findings, and joining us tonight to discuss the report is Isami Arafuku. She is the coordinator of the research. She is the coordinator of research of the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, and also joining us is Kimberly Kwong. She is a youth commissioner for San Francisco, representing District 3, and soon to join us is Maria Su, who is the executive director of the Vietnamese Youth Development Center, and I want to. Um, thank you all for joining us on Apex Express. Well, thank you for inviting us. So, I mean, could you start, Isami, and, you know, let's start with you and give us a general idea of what the report is, like an overview, and also maybe you can touch on the organizations who um, were involved with this. Sure. Um, the This report came about as a result of an organization called the Say Consortium, and it has a number of organizations, including the Japanese Community Youth Council, the Bill Paul Memorial Center of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinics, 
the Community Youth Center, Korean Center, Inc., and Vietnamese Youth Development Center, and the West Bay Filipino Multi-Service Center. Um, they, as direct service providers to youth in San Francisco, felt that there were a lot of needs that API youth had in San Francisco, which um, they knew anecdotal as a result of their direct experience, um, but they were unable to find data which substantiated this. And, of course, one of the things that's been happening recently is uh, evidence-based kinds of, of um, um, needs. And so the SAE Consortium uh, asked the National Council on Crime and Delinquency to assist them in obtaining data which would subs- to basically um, document needs that had previously not been done. Uh, so we began over a year ago, held a large community meeting in which uh, organizations and individuals were invited to participate. And it's been uh, about, we spent about 10 months collecting data, looking at different sources. Uh, reports uh, done by the city and county of San Francisco, looking at um, data from the probation department, looking at school data, looking at the kinds of surveys that the schools did, and also looking for uh, data that related to behavioral health, meaning mental health issues as well as substance issues. That's the voice of Isami Arifuku, who is the coordinator of research at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And, you know, with all of the research and data that the research, the research and data that was found, maybe you could touch on some of the main findings of the report. Sure. Um, we found that reflecting national state trends, Asian youth in San Francisco report high levels of depression and thoughts of suicide compared to youth of other ethnicities and Asian females report feeling depressed more often than Asian males. Uh, Again, reflecting national trends, a third to one-half of Asian youth in San Francisco state that their four closest Asian friends use marijuana, alcohol, or other drugs. And although this is not a direct self-report of substance use, the association with peers who use substances increases the likelihood of such use in youth. Um, At least one-third of Asian youth report being hit by their partners, meaning their boyfriend, their girlfriend, um, which is uh, higher than a lot of the figures show in terms of like dating violence or other forms of interpersonal violence. And then when you look at Asian youth as a group, they have low numbers of arrests. Uh, but when we disaggregate it by ethnicity, differences between groups emerge. So you see that Chinese, Vietnamese, and Filipino youth have the most arrests over the uh, uh, over the decade, 1990 to 2000. But when you look at arrest rates, Vietnamese had the high one, had the highest arrest rate of Asian youth when all arrests were taken into account. Uh, when we look at other kinds of data, you see that Asian youth have the highest likelihood of being taken out of the home and put into a group home, putting into some kind of institution, if you look at all the kids who had actually gone through the adjudication process. And when you disaggregate by ethnicity, we see that Cambodian youth had the highest percentage of -of out-of-home placement after adjudication at 71%. Uh, the other thing that is very striking is that Asian females are increasingly appearing in the juvenile justice statistics. And that reflects a trend among all females, but the Asian females have one of the highest rates of increase. So it seems like there's a lot of data that came out of this report, and it's unique in that it's dissecting Asian communities in because it's such a diverse um, there's so much diversity within API communities that it's the first report of its kind to really look at specific communities within the Asian community, quote unquote. And I know Kimberly, you spoke at the press conference, and I wondered, I'm wondering why you think this report is important. You know, with all the information that was presented, what is the importance of having something like this? Well, it's important because um, youth in general have little representation everywhere. And it's even more important for the API youth because they have even a harder time becoming noticed and recognized. And they somehow just don't become known in the system and their problems are not um, seen or they 
because API youth is set up as a model minority, people feel that they don't have problems or they don't have certain needs, and in reality, they do. And it's very important that these problems or needs are recognized, and this report does just that. And what did you present at the uh, press conference specifically? Well, um, it talks about how how youth, in a way, don't really know how to become, um, you know, helped or, in other ways, how to get their needs met. And um, I spoke about how I did some outreach at San Francisco's Newcomer High School and where many of the aging youth, um, they don't know how to look for resources on health or education, and they're also unaware of all the ways they could become involved with the government, such as the Youth Commission or the Student Advisory Council or other community organizations where they can become, you know, part of um, the resolution or the solution of these problems. That's the voice of Kimberly Kwong. She is a youth commissioner for San Francisco, representing District 3. And also joining us is Isami Arifuku, who is the coordinator of research for the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And Kimberly, you, being a youth commissioner for San Francisco, what does that mean? And also, you know, maybe you could break down some of the percentages of the people who you represent. Well, um, very strikingly, um, API youth make up according to the 2000 census, make up 31% of the San Francisco youth population. That is the second highest behind white. And in my own district, which is District 3, that's the North Beach and Chinatown area and somewhat downtown, that's 47% um, Asian API youth in this district. And, um, and it's very important that they're noticed because there's so many of them, and myself included, and whether these needs may be about health, education, or juvenile justice, it's important to recognize them and address them. And Isami, what do you hope to do with these, um, the findings of the report? What do you think can come out of it? Um, I think the most, one of the important things that happened as a result of the report was um, the organization of Asian Youth Advocacy Network. Uh, and that is a coalition of organizations who serve Asian youth who will advocate for uh, greater services, uh, greater attention, uh, greater listening to API youth in terms of identifying what their needs are, and to uh, have an ongoing relationship with different city and county agencies so that the needs of Asian youth become uh, appear on the agenda rather than being... Uh, just excluded or, you know, not even considered. So that, I think that's the most important thing that can happen. And Kimberly, do you want to speak on this? Well, um, I think it's, that's one of the main things that should be done. And also the outreach should really be made out to API youth and their families um, as a whole because in order for the youth to succeed, their family has to be there to support them. And if the family doesn't have any way to be in contact with things that their child or children is doing, there's no way that they could give support because many Asian families have very high expectations for Asian youth, but they don't recognize that the problems and the pressure that youth face in school or between or within their peers, and it's very important that Asian parents are informed that, you know, what happens in school or what happens, you know, on the streets or when, you know, um, friends get together, how um, Asian youth interact with each other and what problems they face. So parents really need to be informed about what's going on, too. You're listening to Apex Express. We're talking about a new report called Moving Beyond Exclusion, focusing on the needs of API youth in San Francisco. We're going to take a quick musical break and listen to a track off of Dub Gabriel's Ascend album. And we'll be right back after this.
And this is music from Ascend, Dub Gabriel. The song is called Celebrate, and let's celebrate more. This is Apex Express. We're talking about a report here tonight called Moving Beyond Exclusion, focusing on the needs of API youth in San Francisco. And joining me to discuss the report is Isami Arifuku, who is the coordinator of research for the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And also with me is Kimberly Kwong, who is a youth commissioner for San Francisco, representing District 3. So I want to welcome you all back. And um, let's move on to talking about the um, what the youth said in the survey. Maybe either of you could break down a little bit of a little more of the findings and what um, they had to report. Well, as I indicated, uh, a third to, to half of the youth who were who participated in the survey indicated that they had a um, they had friends who use marijuana, alcohol, or other drugs. Uh, in addition, they say that they are experiencing and observing violence at, at school and traveling to school. Uh, and they, every youth reported seeing at least one fight on the way to school and at least one fight at school. The other thing that was kind of surprising was to find that more than half of Asian youth state that they see drug dealers in their neighborhood at least once a week. And in terms of like breaking it out by ethnicity, uh, 88% of Cambodia, Cambodian youth make this statement. So, um, there, the Asian youth are, we're learning some things about Asian youth that generally, uh, have not been, um, documented in any sort of way. So this, this is new information that I think we need to pay attention to. And Kimberly, is there anything that you want to add? Well, like Asami said, I think the most striking finding was 100% youth survey reported seeing one fight on the way to school, at least one fight at school in the past week. That is a very striking finding to me. And also another really striking one was in California, Asian youth had the highest percentage, 16.5%, as compared to other ethnic groups admitted to a treatment facility for the use of stimulants in 1999. And I think it's very important that we recognize all these um, issues facing API youth, and, you know, we have to do something about that. That's the voice of Kimberly Kwong, Youth Commissioner for San Francisco. And joining us is Maria Su, who is the Executive Director of the Vietnamese Youth Development Center. I want to thank you so much for coming tonight. I know you just came from a meeting <laughs> through traffic, um, and it's been crazy out there, I heard. Yes. So, yeah, welcome. Thank you. I can give everybody a very thorough traffic report from the Bay Bridge. It's, it's really bad. Yeah, don't, don't, don't go. And if you're on don't the Bay Bridge, it. I hope you're having a good time listening to us. Yeah. So maybe you could talk about the meeting you just came from and how it um, fits into the report that we're discussing. Yeah. Um, I just left the uh, Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council meeting, um, which is a meeting that is held... Um, on a monthly basis, well, on a regular basis with the juvenile uh, probation department. Um, and today's meeting, we discussed a um, a 16% reduction in funds to juvenile justice programs um, across the city. And um, already there was already a 4% reduction. So this is on top of that. Um, and there's also discussions on reductions in TANF money. Um, so, so what will these... Um budget cuts mean for the JV system and how will it impact um, the API youth in the counties? Um, well, there will be a serious impact in terms of uh, perhaps even cutting case workers or case managers who work one-on-one -on -one with the youth um, in uh, who, who's in probation right now. Um, as well as different services um, that each community-based organizations provide um, with uh, juvenile justice departments. So with the findings of the report and the surveys, what are some of the recommendations that come out of the reports? And either um, anyone can answer this who, who wants to. Like, where do we go f from here with the information that, that was gathered? Well, there's two broad issues that uh, come from the data, um, and that has to do with the need to disaggregate data into the specific API ethnicities. 
because it's clear that when you, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at Asians as a group, that it really masks a lot of the the needs of certain communities, and generally these are the newer uh, Asian immigrants to the United States. Um, the second thing is that there's a very high proportion of API youth whose parents are immigrants and are not re- don't really have language accessibility in terms of dealing with the school system, the probation department, the police, any of the systems that the youth are involved in. So there's a need for outreach, information, and communication in the appropriate languages. And the, one of the important things for API youth in particular is to provide a context for instructions and notices so they will understand the implications of the information they are receiving because for the, their, their experiences are so different than the experience of their children. Right. And I know, Kimberly, you work with, I mean, sorry. I know, Maria, that you work with um, youth at the Vietnamese Youth Development Center. Right. And what have your experiences been in this work well, um, like what Isami just said, that it's very important for us to provide services that are not only just culturally sensitive to the families, but also linguistically appropriate. Um, a lot of the families um, that find themselves in juvenile justice situations um, don't speak English well or don't even understand the American culture well. Um, so what we have are caseworkers who are of these different cultures um, that come out not only to support families during uh, court cases or um, translate during probation meetings, but also work with the families and go into the, the homes and talk with parents and explain to them what are the process that's going to happen. And I think the one thing that's really great about the report is that it finally recognizes what um, community-based organizations such as VYDC or such as the other organizations that are culturally appropriate are doing right now. Mm-hmm. And it's just giving voice to that and recognition to that. And that was my next question was that being from a grassroots organization, um, you know, the importance, bring out the importance of having so many community um, organizations come together for this report seems to be um, something that hasn't been done before. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and, hmm, you're listening to Apex Express on KPFA, and that was the voice of Maria Su, who's the executive director of the Vietnamese Youth Development Center, and on the phone is Kimberly Kwong, a youth commissioner for San Francisco, and Isami Arifuku, who is the coordinator of research for the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And if people want to get more information about the Vietnamese Youth Development Center and your services, maybe you want to say a few words about this organization and how they can do that. Of course. Um, So the Vietnamese Youth Development Center um, is actually located in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. We are on 150 Eddy Street. Um, That's right next to the Powell Street BART station. Um, We were founded in 1979 by Vietnamese immigrants who settled in the Tenderloin District, and um, their vision was to provide a an agency or, or kind of like a safe haven for neighborhood youth to just come and hang out. Um, and from that, it grew to us serving over 620 youth per year, um, reaching from all different cultures. We serve now a large Cambodian, Vietnamese, and Laos um, population. Um, we also provide services in the schools as well as our, our own agency we do lots of different different programs and tutoring things. So they can go on the website, which is at www.vydc.org, um, and just find out some more stuff on us. We're in the process of, of kind of redoing our, our website. So, you know, just come back and check us out. And do you have a phone number people can yes. call? We, um, you can call 415-771-771. Two six zero zero. Again, the website is www.vydc.org, and the number is four one five seven seven one two six zero zero to reach the Vietnamese Youth Development Center. And Isami, maybe you want to give out some information on how people can get more information on the report and any other contacts that you want to give out. If you want a copy of the report, or you, uh, I guess the easiest thing to do is to call um, 
Seichi, S-E-I-I-C-H-I, at Japanese Community Youth Council. And the number is, I think it's 415-563-8052. You are good. Sorry, I sprang that on you. <laughs> and do you want to say anything about the um, National Council on Crime and Delinquency? Sure. NCCD is a research and policy organization. Uh, it's been around since 1907. has changed somewhat <laughs> in its orientation since then. Um, we do... Um, Applied research, meaning we do research that people can use immediately, whether it's evaluations or doing the kind of uh, research that we did with the SAE Consortium. Um, and our website is www.nccd-crc.org. Or you can give me a call at area code 510-208-0500, and I'm at extension 333. Great. Again, that um, website is ncd-crc.org, and the number is 208-0500, extension 333. Yes. And Kimberly Huang, I want to give you the last word. You're the youth, youth, you're a youth commissioner for San Francisco. What, inf- what do you want to leave us with this evening? Um, what are some of the ways that we can be allies with youth and help provide some solutions for the future. Well, this is kind of ironic because that's what happened at the press conference where I said the last thing. Um, I think the most, I don't know if you guys were there, but um, I think the most important thing right now is for youth to be aware of this, for API youth to to be aware of the findings and to be involved in, you know, changing themselves from the statistics to people who are making a change. And there's so many ways they could get involved. They could lobby, you know, like their their politicians, their representatives, the board of supervisors, the mayor. Their doors are always open as long as you go in and, you know, just talk to them and tell them about your problems. And secondly, I think it's very important for their parents to get involved somehow. So I know Nico's, was, Nico's Chinese Health Coalition was part of this, and I think they do a very good job of outreaching too. And um, I think that's what's really important for parents to also recognize the problems and issues that their youth is facing. And the most important thing, that youth become a voice in solving this problem, not just taking orders of different department heads saying that this is right and this is wrong and this is what we should do and this is what we shouldn't do. But the youth should be involved and they should have a say in what is the right direction that we should take. Great. I want to thank you all for joining us on Apex Express. Isami Arifuku, Maria Su, and Kimberly Kwong, I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're going to go out with a poem by Youth Speaks, and we'll be right back. Some people believe that humans were put on this planet for a purpose that evolution is some great teleological process in which the greatness of humanity is the end. To that I say, bullshit. (laughs) It's insanity to believe that humanity, as it stands today, is the end of evolution. Those who subscribe to this belief only imbibe their minds with selfish, anthropocentric thoughts, compounded into what sounded like the silent deaths of thousands, because I sure as hell hope to God that the great leaders of our world don't represent the pinnacle of man. Because George Bush still strikingly resembles a monkey. And still we consume, despite the impending doom of destroying the earth and everything living on it. War, petroleum dependencies, hummers. Jesus, could people get any dumber? Okay. Because fighting for peace is like fighting for virginity. But war is coming. War is coming. George Bush is coming all over us. And Tony Blair is his right hand. And we are not swallowing their preemptive action bullshit. We are spitting it out. Checking our evolutionary clock. Seems as though we're running out of time. And I'd walk straight into George W.'s office and appeal to his cop because that's the only thing he's thinking with. And in a skanky ass white dress, I'd sing. War. Who. Ha. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Everybody now. War. Who. Ha. 
What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <sighs> In conclusion, humanity is not the ultimate end. And looking around here, I have hope. We are chaos theory at its best. We are all butterflies flapping our wings and storms are about to erupt. And we are pushing evolution. We are the living revolution. Thank you. That was Holly Chen with her poem called Sex and Politics. She is with Youth Speaks, and Youth Speaks is having their semifinals this weekend at the ODC Theater, and that's at 3153 17th Street in San Francisco, and you can call 415-863-9834 for more information. They're going to be having more events coming up very soon, and you're listening to Apex Express. Stay tuned. You're listening to Apex Express. I'm Ranjita Giesler. Joining us in the studio is Rajika Bandari. She is with ECTA, and on the phone is Shalini Guerra, and she is with Friends of South Asia, and they're here tonight to talk about the Traveling South Asian Film Festival, which is happening now until the 21st. So I want to welcome both of you to Apex Express. Thank you. So let's start with you, Rajika. Give us a little history of the film festival and tell us basically um, what it's about. So this is a film festival that uh, we're hosting, Ekta's hosting for the third time. And this year we're hosting it uh, along with uh, Friends of South Asia. And it builds off a festival that's held every year in Nepal. And the festival um, brings together documentary filmmakers from all different uh, countries in the South Asian region and uh, provides a platform for documentary films about uh, important social and political issues um, in the region. And then um, the festival that's held in Nepal travels all over the world and um, Ekta has been the only group to um, host this festival in California. And as I said, this is the third time we're doing it. And this year we're collaborating with uh, Friends of South Asia. And maybe talk a little bit about why you wanted to collaborate with Friends of South Asia and why is it important to bring this, this film festival to the United States and California? Um, well, Friends of South Asia was basically set up in order to promote um, dialogue between various peoples of South Asia. And so in that sense, the Documentary Film Festival falls very well within what um, Friends of South Asia does. Um, and there is a huge South Asian diaspora in California right now, and there is a, lot, a need for various peoples within the diaspora to talk to each other. Um, through documentaries, we are finding out that uh, that people from Bangladeshi diaspora, for example, are managing to get their voice across to people from the Pakistani diaspora. They're exchanging stories that would not, that are not possible to do in South Asia, but it is possible to do that in, in, um, California where there is an intermingling of various peoples. And also these films are highlighting very many issues that are important for the American public to listen to. It's not just a question of South Asia. It's South mm -hmm. Asia as a very dynamic region in the world where a lot of movements are happening where a lot of people are engaged in various movements which are directly being affected by American policies and the American government. So in that sense, it is a voice of South Asian people which we are bringing to the U.S. That's the voice of Shalini Guerra, and she's with Friends of South Asia. We're speaking about the Traveling South Asian Film Festival. Because there's such a diversity within the South Asian community, what are some of the specific topics that, that one can see at the film festival? Some of the issues that we're highlighting in this festival are the issues of women's rights. Um, we have um, Friday. Uh, it's devoted to talking about women's issues and issues of gender and sexuality. Um, we're also highlighting questions of communalism. As y you know, um, South Asia is a multicultural, a multi-religious um, uh, region. 
and there have been tensions between um, different communities and often highlighted by political interests. So sat- this Saturday screenings are going to be devoted to the issue of communalism. On Sunday, we're highlighting the issue of economic development. There, there are a lot of multinationals um, now investing in the South Asian subcontinent, and, and opposing them are people's movements, movements of indigenous people, and there's a whole question of who really has control of economic resources. Um, and those are the questions we're highlighting um, this Sunday. And Rajika, maybe you want to talk about some of the highlights that you want to bring out about the festival as well. Yeah, a um, few things that I wanted to mention were that um, this year's festival is really unique in several ways. One is that although we build off uh, of the Nepali festival that I mentioned earlier, we have added several other films to really make this a unique um, selection of films. And uh, three of the films that we've included in this festival were not screened um, at uh, the recently held Mumbai uh, International Film Festival in India. And um, the reason they were excluded was because of their anti-establishment content. And this sparked um, a massive protest throughout the country where as many as 160 documentary filmmakers threatened to remove their own films from the International Film Festival. And in fact, there was an alternate festival that was held to showcase these um, really provocative and um, important films. So that's one thing unique about our festival, that we do have three films um, that were part of that group of films. Another important thing is we do have two films by a Pakistani uh, woman filmmaker, Sabiha Sumar, and um, uh, her films, uh, both of the films that we have uh, focus on women's issues in Pakistan and are currently not seen in her native country and uh, we are screening two of her films. So I think in those ways, uh, this year's festival is uh, really a unique one and a rare opportunity to see some of these films. And I also want to add that six of the films uh, that are part of the festival also screened at the recently held World Social Forum in uh, Bombay. And how can people get more information about the film festival? Um, the web address is www.ekta.org, and Ekta is spelled E-K-T-A. And from that, there's a direct link um, to the festival information. And as Shalini mentioned, the festival runs um, at the Mission Cultural Center this coming weekend, March uh, 19th through the 21st and then it runs March 26th through the 28th at the India Community Center in Milpitas and um, the Friday evening screening begins at 7 p.m. and ends at 10 and on Saturday and Sunday on the 19th and the 21st the screenings are from 3 to 6 p.m. and again these are at the Mission Cultural Center and again the web address is www.ekta.org. And is there anything that you want to add about the idea of censorship in India, in Pakistan? Why is it so important that people come out and see these films? This is Shalini. Um, I think we do want to emphasize that a lot of the documentary makers in South Asia who are making these really wonderful pieces of work in journalism, um, they are working under severe financial and political constraints. Um, So... It is important for people to appreciate, to first of all, to come to these festivals to make it possible for these documentary makers to keep on doing the work that they're doing. Um, we are seeing some really brilliant pieces of um, not only resistance come through, but also analysis of what is development, um, questions of who really benefits from the kind of development we're seeing. And also um, there are some examples of really good investigative journalism uh, that we're seeing at this festival. For example, um, there is this documentary that we are screening, which is called Go Through the, Ter- the Terror Trail, which documents what happens to a compartment in a train that got burned and which ended up sparking massive violence in the western state of Gujarat two years ago. The government never did follow up with this investigation, so it, is, it was left up to independent people and independent sources to follow up on the investigation and find out what exactly happened and why the government did not follow up on the carnage. 
Um, and it is only by hosting film festivals and, you know, by getting the word out, getting people to see them, that we can actually start discussing some of these issues and also providing support to these documentary makers who are working under really adverse conditions in South Asia. Yeah, and I just wanted to sort of reiterate one thing Shalini said earlier on, that um, even as far as the audience here in the Bay Area is concerned, um, it's an opportunity to actually see some films which it would be very hard to see back in their home countries simply because due to political reasons these films are often not screened and uh, that's one thing um, both FOSA and Ekta try and do and I know that Ekta in the past has also hosted film festivals where we've brought in filmmakers and films that are actually um, almost impossible to see in the native country of the filmmaker. You're listening to Apex Express. We're talking about the Traveling South Asian Film Festival, and we're speaking with Rajika Bandari and also Shalini Guerra. Rajika's with ECTA, and Shalini's with um, the Friends of South Asia. Are there any films that you would like to highlight for us? Um, I could perhaps just mention a little bit about um, some of the films that focus on uh, women's issues in South Asia simply because this is a key issue and several of the films um, deal with it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have two films by the Pakistani filmmaker Sabiha Sumar and one has already screened. Um, it's a film called For a Place Under the Heavens that deals with the effect of rising um, religious fundamentalism in Pakistan and its effects on uh, women in Pakistani society. But we do have another film of hers coming up called Don't Ask Why. And um, this film is sort of like a diary that takes us into the life of uh, a 17-year-old girl growing up um, in a conservative and patriarchal society and what effects that has on um, her, some of her aspirations. And um, another film... Um, which is an outstanding film, is by uh, Rina Mohan. And uh, this is a film called Skin Deep, and it's uh, about urban middle-class women in India, and it explores um, women's notions of body image and um, self-perceptions um, about their bodies and uh, how, these, how their relationships with their bodies can often be um, complicated. So those are um, some of the films on women's issues. I'd just like to draw attention to another great film that we're showing. It's called A Night of Prophecy by a, a very f prominent filmmaker called Amar Kamar. We've already screened it once, but we're showing it again in the South Bay. And this film deals with the use of song in poetry for, for expressing histories of oppression, bondage, and exploitation. It's a really interesting movie in that it, everything in the movie, all the sound, all those spoken words are in poetry or song. And it goes through various parts of India and captures the various movements that are going on in poetry and song, through poetry and song. Um, we start off, the movie starts off with a person talking about the oppression of low castes. It moves to um, Bombay where there is somebody reciting a poem about uh, a boy growing up with a, a mother who's a prostitute. It goes to Nagaland where there are struggles of self-determination going on. And then it ends in Kashmir where there there are again poets and people singing songs about how, how their homeland has been broken up by um, all the civil war that has been raging around them. Um, so that's one movie that I think is especially worth watching. That's the voice of Shalini Guerra, and she's with Friends of South Asia. And we're speaking about the South Asian Film Festival, and you can catch it at the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco through March 21st, then at the India Community Center in Milpitas, on the weekend of the 26th through the 28th. In closing, Rajika Bandari, maybe you want to talk a little bit about ECTA and give their information out once more. Sure. Um, ECTA was started um, in the Bay Area a few years ago, and uh, it's a non-profit organization um, whose goal is to use the medium of the arts to promote a progressive social and political message within the South Asian community. And as part of doing that, we support um, all forms of arts. We um, do several film festivals. We support um, uh, dance performances, music performances, art exhibits, and really the whole spectrum of um, arts coming out of uh, South Asia, as well as actually local um, artists. So that's 
that's what Ekta is about. And uh, again, the web address um, for the organization as well as for the festival is www.ekta.org and Ekta is spelled E-K-T-A. And Shalini, talk a little bit about Friends of South Asia. Um, the basic mission of Friends of South Asia is to achieve a prosperous, peaceful South Asia. Our main focus is on the demilitarization of South Asia and the creation of a nuclear-free subcontinent and the promotion of a South Asia where rights of everyone, especially minorities, are respected. The way we got together uh, was uh, two years ago when tensions between India and Pakistan were really, really high and it looked like war could break out any moment. And then a bunch of us just started holding peace vigils at various places around um, the bay in front of the Indian consulate, at uh, the public squares, at uh, next to the lake. Um, and that's how a lot of us got together. And then we thought it, even after the tensions went down, we thought it was important to continue the spirit. And since then, we've been organizing um, documentary screenings, dialogues, talks um, in an effort to increase this people-to-people contact, um, which I think is essential for creating a peaceful South Asia. I want to thank you both for joining us on Apex Express. Thank you. Thanks. Listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM, and on the line with me is Christine Padilla. She's the executive director of CATS, which is a co producer of the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival in San Jose. And she's here to tell us about an event that's happening this coming Saturday, March 20th, and it's called Directions in Sound. I want to welcome you to Apex Express, Christine. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Yes, uh, we kick off the San Francisco end of the festival this Friday the 19th, and it, it's a weekend festival here in San Jose. And Saturday night, we have an event called Directions and Sound, which is basically our music event of the festival that showcases Asian American um, musicians and DJs. This year, we've got a great lineup. We've got DJ Mike Nice from Word Life Promotions. He's also done a lot of radio stuff, Tone Deaf from KML and SBC, Fuse One from the NC Collective, and Halo from Distortion to Static, which is actually um, an independent hip-hop show on uh, WB20. And why do you think it's important to have a um, Directions in Sound event kind of collaborating with the film festival? Um it is important because um, with the festival, we have a lot of different elements. Obviously, there's film screenings, panel discussions, school screenings. There's a lot of educational aspects, um, reception. So it's always nice to have some sort of music club event. It, it, it definitely adds a lot of fun to it. It's great for our younger festival audience, you know, 21 and over, you know, to get together. And also just to showcase and highlight all of the great Asian-American, um, you know, music talent that we have here in the Bay Area. That's the voice of Christine Padilla, Executive Director of CATS. And we're talking about an event that's happening March 20th called Directions in Sound. And if folks attend this event, what would it be like for them? Um, it's a really fun event, actually. We're going to have lots of hip-hop um music really talented djs it's a really good vibe lots of um people who go to the festival as well as just san jose community folks come out to the club really um you know good crowd of people have a lot of fun have a couple drinks and dance um it's definitely a dancing event people usually come just to hang out and dance and socialize you know it's kind of um towards the end of the festival so it's great it's kind of a great outlet for people to get together and hang out you know you've been in films all day just watching films so it's it's one of our great events that's really good for um just getting to meet the people that come out and just relaxing a little bit and uh it's a good time to get up and dance and move the yes. body after yes. so many hours Definitely. of sitting <laughs> yes so this is part of the san francisco international asian american film festival do you want to say a little bit about this festival 
Yeah, the festival has been going on for 22 years in San Francisco, and um, because of the need for it in San Jose, Kat started collaborating with Nata four years ago. So this is our fourth year in San Jose to bring it out to the South Bay. Um, every year we've expanded, and our audience has grown, and our programming has grown, um, because there is such a need for this type of festival here in San Jose. So it, it's been great. Um this, you know, this weekend we'll be showing everything from international films, uh, featured length films, Asian American films, shorts programs, um, documentaries. So we've got a really great lineup. And of course, you can always check our website to get a list of all of the films, which is um, www.asiantheater.org. Okay, and one more time, can you give out the just basic information, the when, where, and hows of the festival? Sure. Uh, the festival is from March 19th through the 21st at the Camera 3 Cinemas, which is located downtown San Jose on 2nd Street and San Carlos. Um, so we've got films going all weekend there. Directions and Sound is at the Agenda Lounge, which is on South 1st Street. And doors open at 9 o'clock. Um, and it's Ten dollars cover charge, and it's twenty-one and over. And again, at the Agenda Cellar, it's three nine nine South First Street. And again, if people want more information, it's www.asiantheater.org. And I believe we have two pairs of tickets to give away to this event. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Great. So if listeners want to go to the Directions and Sound awesome event at 399 South 1st Street in San Jose, call us right now at 510-848-4425 to get a um, free pair of tickets to go to this cool event. Is there anything else you want to add? Oh, no. I just hope people come out and, you know, have a good time. Thank you so much for joining us, Christine Padilla from Executive Director of CATS, for joining us tonight. So, Thanks for having me. This is Apex Express, and we do have our winners for that event. Also, uh, Persian New Year is coming up. I want to wish everybody a happy New Year. Friday, March 19th, there's an event, Noor the Light, a night of Egyptian, Pan-Arabic, and Asian rhythms featuring Bangra, Pakistani, Egyptian, Persian dance, and more, featuring many DJs, DJ Rafi, DJ Sep, our own KPFA DJ Sep, has her show on Monday nights here at 10, I think, 10. And also Tabla Master Susu. And this is happening at the Elba Room, 647 Valencia Street at 17th Street. For more information, call 415-552-7788. And the event is from 10, a- 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 21 and over show. Again, the number for more information, 415-552-7788, Friday, March 19th, Elbow Room. We actually have two pairs of tickets to give away to this event as well here on Apex Express. So give us a call, 